new from Hollow Knight Collection. Embrace the world of Hallow's Nest with this dreadful set of figures. Feel the wrath of the void with your own shade terrarium. Or all of these spooky sets for your Psych October season? Illuminate your void with the little night and its shade for your evening. Each one sold separately. Happy Halloween, everyone. Enjoy this year Psych October special. Okay, dude, calm down. Ahoy, jitters and little men of all ages and colors, and that head of color rainbow in between. Welcome back to the Den of the Myth, the place where we... 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 What the fuck do we do? I don't know. Well, nevertheless, I beseech you a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, and whatever the fuck you doing, or who you doing, because it's Halloween! Today is Halloween, I have to call my friend Ball Sniff. That's right, me mighties, it is again a psychotober time. The time to have lots of an adulterated alcohol dress like your father figure was never present after going for a gallon of milk. <laughs> Diabetes galore levels of consumption and lots and lots of unprotected sex! Oh yeah! <laughs> And on the past times, I have tended to give back to my tiny, small community my passion projects of the spooks. And of course, this time is no different. I have mentioned the sense of dread for horror, and also the sense of disillusion and isolation in my first Psycho Clover. And also the idea of facing the shadows of the world while embracing the dark tombs of what we fear to become the monster. Since fear is what makes us stronger, to overcome great adversities, to actually become more than the personal self. Right, Virgil? Pathetic. I am the storm that is With this time, I wanted to rail a little before we go to our main course, kind of like when you ask for a piece of bread and butter before your full meal arrives. Even though I like to munch on bread a oh, shit ton, fuck, why is the Cheesecake Factory's bread so fucking good? Give me the fucking recipe, goddamn no! I need to calm down! Oh my god! For many, the horror genre only falls upon what makes us scared or to ensure fear in others. And we know about dreadful aesthetics and visual effects in auditory cues and yada yada. Although we forget to take into account that a very important influence helped the idea of classic horror to be born. A lot of people return to the original Dracula, Werewolf, and Frankenstein monster movies of the old black and white that made the gothic cinema boom and forged the horror genre as it is. But nobody speaks about the most important movie for the gothic aesthetic. Nosferatu.
Nosferatu was a movie from the 1920s from Germany that put the entire path of gothic horror into the entire entertainment industry. There are an infinite numbers of references and evolutions on the expressive arts that delve into the gothic genre. This day! The impact that Nosferatu made in the industry is seen through movies, cartoons, comic books, manga, and even video games. Germanic Gothic aesthetic is something that a lot of people take for granted, but it is so necessary in horror for it to work. With the correct illumination and lack of it, the audio to creep up on one until that sudden rise of tension both visually and psychologically. My exposure has been on not just the architecture of Catholic Gothic design, civil but also how in certain Vatican's of fantasy influence, gothic aesthetic is very heavily influenced. And it makes my little proud heart beat like a heart-style rave. While the gothic aesthetic is more than present in what I have presented, what if we go into the idea of facing the world of gothic dreadful loss, a sense of complete desolation, complete and utter, loveless gothic dread, or as many would call it, forgotten by the gods. If there is one genre that has been created recently and has been overtaking the internet is what you would call Soulsborne. You see, the first time I encountered this was with a couple of guys playing something called Demon Souls. This game looked like a generic gothic fantasy game at first. I was so wrong. It was gigantic, heavily detailed, and everything was out to get you. It was unfair, nasty, and honestly the only way I can describe these games both visually and in gameplay? The Gaping Dragon. The Soulsborne genre is one that takes the gothic influence and puts it on cocaine and steroids. It is over over every single thing can kill you. Everything that would be majestic, menacing, or badass looking has been corrupted, crippled, dissected, skinned, or turned mad. It's with the visuals and such horror things that could even scare the shit out of Lockcraft. And gameplay wise, it is so fucking hard. I played Dark Souls once and I fucking returned the game first week cause I was too much of a fucking pansy to face it. While I still had knowledge of the games, the one that got me heavily interested was Bloodborne, which still kicked the shit out of my ungaped ass, but it helped me understand one thing. These games have a passion hidden only to those that keep standing up. The games reward you with every single opponent, every enemy, every boss, every monster, but in order to overcome, then you must get good. Soulsborne is not a casual gaming experience, and my current experience with Elden Ring can tell you that I am so amazed and in love with the entire world. These games have so much love and passion with lore that is hidden only to those that acquire the patience, not only to traverse their main paths, but also to explore and find more about the world through these few NPCs available that have so much story hidden within the weapons and special items you can find. 
And for one to truly investigate the background and tragedy behind every single boss these games have to offer for every single one of them has one thing in common. They were once grand, and now they are at a stage that not even God would fathom to see them. And yours is the only hand willing to put them down. You will fail, but it is up to you to stand up once more every single time, until that spark of flame of yours either extinguishes or burns stronger to overcome its obstacle. You see, I am astonished to meet people that love these games to the point that they express how it has saved their lives, not just by making them find something to be passionate about, but the fact that some people can be in the darkest bottom and find this as an inspiration to rise up and fight off their own creeping and hulking horrors of this life and keep on going. One step back and two steps forward. In the end, one must overcome. I think I learned to understand that with this genre of video games, it embodies the Germanic Gothic philosophy of finding beauty in the horrors of the real world or in our darkest confidence. And that I can take a toast to. I still don't understand the fucking simping for the crazy women on these games and who in their goddamn mind would want to fuck this. Cool after corpse left in my wake. She is a fucking bench pressing monstrous rotting ginger with some limbs missing. I don't care if she's naked when you fight her. Look at those fucking arms. You are going to die. I'm going to coom. Now on another note, taking all of that horrible desolation, loss, corruption and dread, and if we put it into something a little bit more cute, well, I would have thought that is impossible until... You see, this is an actual game. A lot of people compare it to the Soulsborne genre, and I would not completely agree, but I wouldn't either disagree. You see, Hollow Knight came to my life in very unexpected times. I just got it because it visually spoke to me. It looked interesting, not realizing it was deemed as a Metroidvania. And you know I am a sucker for exploration isolation games. When Metroid and Castlevania were the only ones that overtook and forged their genre, then after a few indie games that overflew the genre's industry, came a wonderful little indie surprise for the limelight, and one that has broken so many records, awards, and hearts of many gamers like me. And his name is Holo Dustin Elysian Tail. Enough about rants, let me take you to my years of an old computer owned since 2012 that was top of a line back then and allowed me to play games fluently like League of Legends and Elsword. But the one game I would struggle to play would be Skyrim, because my frames would drop humongously whenever I would be in the open, and so I learned the limits of my computer back then. And to think that motherfucker held forth until 2020, when I finally had to upgrade to my current computer. But back then, I got my own digital copy of Hollow Knight on my PC, and it started off with my controller and comfy chair, and I got introduced to such a world of beautiful violin and piano music, some hand-drawn and backgrounds and animations, and a very tiny and cute and cuddly little main character that stares at my soul. Though most of my gaming in Hollow Knight has been done on my Switch, which I played during some very harsh times of my life, and it helped me really have some uprising. I guess games truly can save lives. Guess I don't need this shotgun anymore, right Eric and Dylan, you little rascals? I'm definitely going to hell for this joke. Now before we jump down further through this hole, let's understand Hollow Knight first. Get a big tub of popcorn and snacks, your favorite two liter soda bottle, and a comfy blanket cause this is long. One's long into the world of Hollow Knight with a small little intro, a poem that isn't complete, and an animation that foreshadows what awaits to the player. And this intro is a perfect way to spin into the wonderful vine that is Hollow's Nest.
The beauty of the scenery, the summer music, the wind's howls, the illumination, the correct angles, and the design of not just the background, but the little night. Everything is perfectly gothic, a sense of horror visually that instead of scaring, it brings a sad and depressing sensation of horror, but instead of darkening, it invites and enlightens the player. I remember being dropped from a huge fall and then going through a very peculiar cave. This vault might not be the tutorial level, it shows one about how curiosity and exploration are the main focus for this game to be enjoyed. There's shadows on the screen that look like vaults and end up having something hidden, doors that always have something more for one to explore, the different enemies that may be brainless or hostile, the many ways to do platforming but to be aware of the surroundings and the environment, to know how hazardous and cautious one has to be, and rewarding the player not just with the goal of their exploration but to easy to miss little things like a small little buff or a small little lore sip. These are what makes Hollow Knight a fucking beauty, and this is just the first few minutes. I did speak about no tutorials, but the game is designed in a way that every time there is a new area, new encounters, and new abilities, the game allows the player to adapt to their own pace. It tutorializes the gameplay easy enough, but allows the player to go on the bike without the helping wheels. While arriving to a giant door that for some reason is locking away the only town available in the beginning, it brings forth more questions for one to answer with their curiosity. And the forgotten crossroads show not just the summer idea of this place being once a rich and empowered place, but the tragedy that has forsaken this place and its natives to the current point. Traversing around was not hard, but it wasn't easy, especially with enemies that have no specific patterns and being surprised for the first time with enemies that have weapons. Make the player learn to adapt not just to the environment, but what will come forth. You cannot just chuck the shit out of your whiskey without trying a few ales beforehand. I would know. And one for me. Now my first harsh experience was with this big thick motherfucker and I thought, oh, is this the first boss? Well guess what, this is just a regular enemy and apparently the first official boss in the game is a fucking big giant bouncing pregnant fly. What am I, plant parent bug? Get him dropping the pretenses, we're a boarding cell. But during my own exploration, I was dumb enough to encounter... Yeah, you see that? That was my first fight, and it took weeks! The hilarity is that this boss teaches that one cannot just use the nail, but also the methods to attack and understand pacing and one's own speed, the usage of jumping and slashing and the key to precision. Precision is a necessity to this game, and the thing is that there are no lives, it's unlimited continues, but with consequences. You see, once you die, you will have a chance to come back from these benches where you can sit down and save your progress, and it is comfy and cozy to sit on these. It's a small reward through the entire Higher somber and horrid environment, but if one wants to keep advancing and not lose monetary progress of these coins used to get upgrades, items for mapping and whatnot, then you must defeat your own shadow, literally. The shed is the echo of one's death, and it plays a very creepy music while near it, but it will chase and have the same damage and abilities as you, so better get to it, if you lose, you lose all the progress and you will have to beat it. If you want to continue, you must overcome your power as failure in order to triumph, a wonderful analogy and body, and so one must overcome the other obstacles, including the beggar's ones. <laughs> After defeating the first obstacles of the pregnant fly in the false night, there is a small detour to exploration. The world is vast, but it can become vaster while feeding one's curiosity, but encountering little unpassable obstacles like this mean fucker. 
One realizes there has to be another way to combat bugs like this, and we do find it with helping a shaman that gives us a Hadouken ability. One thing to realize is that many of these little missions are side quests, but the game doesn't give you a big ass icon and description for it. No, one can choose not to do them and just move on, but these side quests contain the rewards that one can use in order to ease the exploration more. Another addition is Cornifer. Cornifer and his wife are some of the most important NPCs, aside from some upgrades and the fact that his little warm humming comes to fruition every area to reassure the player of a safe spot and get a map of the said area and also being able to add to the map and know one spot with a quill and a compass. Every time I found a new area, all I could think is where the fuck is Cornifer? And it was comforting to find him and know more of my surroundings, and with passing through for gotten crossroads and this puking fuck with my Hadouken than my encounter to Greenpath. Greenpath is a less somber area of hollowness. It has almost the same enemies as Forgotten Crossroads plus some, but in a less mindless version. As if this was an area less affected, passing through this beautiful place shows that there is more to this world than one could fathom, and I've wanted to learn all about it until I encounter Hornet. Hornet is the defending boss fight that separates those who give up and those who continue. You see, on my first playthrough on PC, because my frames kept dropping, I could barely make a hit on her. Then on the Switch, I was finally able to fight properly, but she was still quite a challenge. But she is one to teach a lot of combat and to prepare the player for the challenges that lie ahead. She is a bit of a learning curve to this world, because from now on everything will be harder. And she will reward one with the death ability, which enables more explorative ideas, just like in Mega Man X when one acquires the dash to open up more maneuvering and the capacities to explore the levels and in combat. The same happens here, but the only way to achieve it is defeating Hornet, and her only demand is... GET THE- after the green path, the world opened up to the fungal oasis, which looks more like a more naturally overgrown area in comparison. Here more fungus and brutal creatures become the challenge, and the key is to use the dash and to be able to learn more precision to overcome, but it is also home to a new area, the Mantis Village. The Mantis Village is a bit of a rough path, for these bugs are not just stronger than everything encountered before, but they roam very well, they can surprise attack, and they can block and counter attack better than all the other bugs. They're one to push the player away, and it shows. But just like Hornet taught us, we have to get good, but beyond getting good is understanding the honor. The Mantis Village is brutal indeed. They do not welcome strangers, and there is this brutal warrior-like aesthetic on their background along with the fungus of the past area. Now, I must avert you a few things. First, this is not a linear game. While some places open faster than others, these are areas that can still be explored through the green path and forgotten crossroads that one couldn't before now that the dash is acquired, which rewards backtracking. There's even a new upgrade to eliminate darker caves, which are a necessity to a very, very dark area. Secondly, in order to advance further than before, one must pass through, but there is a way to explore with just the dash, but once one passes through the heart of the Mantis Village, this battlefield is shown with four thrones. One broken and three with some Mantis are resting, but as soon as you walk towards them, they look up to you, and one option appears to challenge. 
Up till now, not a single boss would allow the option to challenge them. It would be unconsenting like a Catholic school. I don't like where this is going. But if one wants to keep going, one can without a problem. But well, there's only so much one can explore. And if you want more, there's only one way to get it. The battle with the Mantis Lords is one that pumps up the difficulty curve, but it doesn't feel unfair. It is hard as boss for sure, and it feels gruesome. But every time one stands up, it makes sense more and more. They have patterns indeed, but one thing I noticed with the AI is that if one uses the Hadouken too much, they become ruthless. The proper combat stand in semi-fair fight is only done with using the nail, so one must prove to them that one can overcome with the swordsmanship only. Once defeating the Mantis Lords, one can pass through other areas now, but now the Mantis village bows down to the Little Knight. It's as if one earned their respect, and instead of hostility, one can now get to the doors once locked and get the Mantis Claws that allow for wall jumps just like in Mega Man X, but that was automatic. And if one keeps passing through some areas, there is one second thing I had to mention. There is this recurring NPC called Squirrel, a little nomad with a mask on top of his head with a thin nail that just passes around. And he sometimes will add small tips or information that can help the player. If one gets overwhelmed from the Mantis Lords, there's always the path to the downtown equivalent of the Hallow's Nest, the City of Tears. Once passing through certain hidden paths to go towards the City of Tears, we encounter many bugs that are equipped with weapons, and from here the Little Knight has to remember both the spacing learned from both the False Knight and Hornet, and the patience and softness of the Mantis Lords in order to overcome these once known warriors of this capital, a city that one would think is a palace of sorts, and the gothic scenery once again shimmers in here. This place has a lot of beautiful sense in its design, and with the accessibility of more bugs of NPCs to grow Dirtmouth that is the hub world of the town and stores, the enjoyable and peaceful growth of getting connections through other lost NPCs that just stay in their specific areas, giving a heart and soul to this world, and of course the idea of upgrading the weapon that we use, the opening of the stack stations which is given by this running stack beetle that with our help connects every area of the kingdom through these underground paths. The quirky and annoying Zolte who keeps appearing and always gets mad at us for saving him, which by the way, there is a fucking achievement for letting him die, but if we let him die, we don't see the full evolution of this quest. And speaking of saving, the grubs. These adorable little worms that once we save each one, we are rewarded for saving them at their own nest. This banker woman beetle that allows me to put my money in her service stall and allows me to retrieve our deposit every time I need. A small little bug that fixes the sign poles every time one breaks them, and a tiny little pig axer that keeps singing and singing as she has aspirations to encounter treasure. Claw, the big female bug warrior that looks for recognition for her bravery within these harrowing caves. And Tiso, a cocky explorer that keeps hitting at looking for a battlefield special for him. Everything across this entire world has awarded the player for its exploration. And the City of Tears makes this become the central point of it all, with its design and location, plus learning of another astral world called the Dream World. And the huge lore learning from now on, making all of this world even the more somber and horrible than it was once believed. Especially once we learn where the title comes from, from Remembrance of the Hollow Knight. This moment after Hornet gives the little knight a sudden turn to the explorative nature and tells us a little of this kingdom befallen and corroded. And with the small glimpses of lore, we learn through the tablets of the world, and now with this statue to the Hollow Knight.
I honestly thought for the longest time that this knight was the Hollow Knight, the one in the title, but in reality the Hollow Knight was once a great hero of legend whose selfless sacrifice had protected Hallowsness from something, but this something has now overtaken the entire kingdom. And now understanding clans, factions, kingdoms, royalty, classes and genocide, it all obscures the cuteness and adorable tense of the game, it becomes gothic horror. The idea of a rich sealing the city of tears away from the other box to fend and survive for themselves while these novels were so paranoid they did not want anything out of this capital. But then little by little consumed by their insanity and their darkest ambitions. These once respected warriors fending as one must pass through them and then pass over the city realizing there is a lake. A blue beautiful lake that is just peaceful and it gives a realization. The city rains constantly because it was built beneath this lake and eventually the lake will cease and destroy the city and eventually everything surrounding it. The further one goes and begins to learn even darker discoveries and with that comes the royal sewers where the quirky and cute goes to die completely. The royal sewers embody the way the higher classes have dumped onto their people and environment, making it all spread out through the kingdom and further up to what is then known as the edge of the kingdom. But on these areas the essence is scary, there are creatures even more mindless than before, violent, harsh, brutal and more twisted than normal, parasitic like, making it alien compared to the bugs. Crossing here, the edge of the kingdom showing a more somber and even darker scene, grayer, filled with a snow-like essence that apparently is ashes of a corpse of a giant being called a worm, which in mythology worms are titanic dragon-like worms. And so the ashes of this corpse that have fallen for ages and ages, with the body still decomposing and finding this giant worm that speaks that his entire body can reach the top and the bottom of the entire area, but even he speaks of himself being smaller than an actual worm. That is mentally scary scary. Further exploration grants us to be very close to a hidden faction that is a hive, with bugs of a beehive that are very violent, brutal, stronger than any other creature, and serving their queen for their greater good, and finally at the end, finding another knight like the little knight and other knights. And this knight has been guarding a possible corpse of the queen of the hive. This in perspective shows that this entire kingdom has been rotting for a long time, overcome by either its nature or the corrupted insane bugs. There's no other choice. Furthermore, in the graveyard areas we learn of two things. The dream world that exists, a universe beyond the afterlife where only the moth clan used to dabble. But also while learning their mastery of a dream nail, a sword of the spiritual energy of the bugs that can be accessed with the energy of the trees that dream. Okay, if we're talking about trees that dream, seriously, this has to do with mushrooms, right? Right? And also, we found out about who reigned this kingdom before the Pale King. A deity that reigned upon the land with a life that was beautiful and inspiring, but with the bugs being primal, they had nothing else to worship. Then as the Moth Clan began to extinguish among with others in a huge war, a war encompassed by the coming of a new leader. The Pale King, nobody knowing where he came from, but he gave the bugs intelligence. He gave them a will, a choice, and a way of becoming more than sentient. And so he raised a kingdom for his own and started to dabble in greater magical arts in order to fight this deity that while doorman became corruption itself out of the revenge rage of being overthrown. A deity that has nothing more than rage if not worship. Gee, sounds fucking familiar, right? Not now, Satan. This entire lore brought a very somber idea of the entire world, learning that this used to be a beautiful land even before the Pale King and then becoming more civilized with the consequence being the infection. A parasitic virus that has spread through the kingdom and reverted the bugs to the original primal state, making them hostile to any non-infected. 
After all, it is how the religion of the Moth Clan forged it, and after learning their powers, one learned of the existence of three higher beings. These beings are seen as godlike, but were once the biggest leaders of the entire kingdom, along with the Pale King. Monomon the Teacher, Lurian the Vulture, and Hera the Beast. Also, if you would open your map, now starts an official main quest to open the Black Egg, which has a huge horrific icon at the beginning of his world below their mouth. Where a CU has appeared in that room that has three symbols that represent the three dreamers which now have to be vanquished in order to open the seal and face whatever is spreading the infection. All of his huge lore information learned through little tidbits and reconnected, but the darkest now brought by the Dream Nail are the Dream Knights. These warriors forgotten that their souls surpass those of the regular dead ones, and their will stronger than life that begs for a battle for them to finally rest. These that in their lives had wonderful actions or atrocious actions done to them. Zero, a warrior executed for his crimes of the murder attempt of the king when being a loyal warrior that eventually was overpowered by the infection. Elder Hoof was a healing shaman that tried to travel the lands to help bugs fight the plaguing infection but died consumed by it. Galleon, a warrior that wanted to be the strongest and one of the king's knights who passed through the horrible deepness to prove himself just to meet his demise. Markoth, one of the Moth's clan that became a warrior weighed by his actions, wanted to meditate and learn, but always haunted by the past until it took its toll. Marmu was a loyal warm guardian of the gardens of the queen, one that would protect the sanctity of the plants until her last breath, waiting for the return of her queen. Gorb, who is just Gorb, but some lore hints at his species being one that tried to learn to use intelligence beyond the power of a spirit, earning his power in the afterlife. And then there's No Eyes, a female knight that was infected by the plague and something horrid happened to her that would play her mind constantly to avoid her to sleep, and so she gouged her eyes out, believing it would stop the sight of what drove her mad, but the voices never stopped. The world of Hollow Knight truly brings the darkest of corners to become the meanest and nastiest. And with the forefront being this cutesy beautiful game hiding such horror that only shows its ugly jaws at those that are brave enough to venture forth and be patient enough to learn how. And with the knowledge of the afterlife, it's also the powers of magic which come from the soul, a form of magic only known by the king, but apparently other bugs try to learn to use and weaponize their soul, and use the other souls in order to master magic, and the outcome shows in the Soul Sanctuary. The Soul Sanctuary is an alchemy research facility of bug experimentation where one encounters the bugs that can use magic to different levels, but also these rotten deformed bugs that have little to no body left. And so much in the background hinting at the turmoiling methods that were being used for these achievements, with the magnum opus being the Soul Master, a bug that masters soul rendering to the point of becoming a true sorcerer, but even trying to use the soul magic to fight the infection was futile for this. But the Soul Master being the only boss fight that even defeated, he clings to the last of his life to use the last of his magic in these brutal bursts that could kill easily, and then he uses his Hadoukens to fight with desperation until he is deceased. Noticing the corpses and remains of a soul sanctum is something that just sours the taste buds visually. The summer darkness of these bugs and their stories truly put more weight onto the saving of this place, if there's any saving. But the bugs are alive, given it's still life and warmth. It makes it feel hopeful. Yeah, because beyond darkness, hope is a never dying spark of light. One thing I can at least express from Hollow Knight is that even with all the desolation, the dreadful loss, the fading of life in all of these lands and confines for this forgotten kingdom, damn, there are still characters that find a small little candle of happiness in their tunnel of darkness. Cunifer and his wife found a way to make a business and to explore the caves. The shamans finds fascination for the reconciliation of the soul magic. 
The stag beetle that loves finding himself back in the resurrection of a stag voice and to reconnect with these areas little by little. Encountering the students of a nail sage, the nail masters, who would have thought that this tiny little fuck would be the nail sage of these thick motherfuckers? The Nail Master is teaching the Little Knight more of the roots of the nail by charging and using the slash on the nail with different forms. And finding how each one has mastered their forms and found ways to live their lives in a peaceful way. The Aura and Mato master the hardest techniques. They still are very sour rivals, distancing each other even though they are brothers. And Shio mastering the most essential of all techniques, the most basic, yet the most important for combat, and evolving to use his knowledge of nail combat into painting, understanding the roots of the usage of that swing, and passing it down. Then let's not forget about this little pill bug that for some odd reason was about to be overtaken by the infection, and as I save her, she developed a huge crush. Hell, you can sneak in her house and find her diary and all the simping she does for the night. The Elder Bug being the only one that stayed in Dirtmouth until it was a ghost town, and now bringing life back to the town, making him more alive. Quirrell being able to find the most peaceful and visually astonishing places in this world as we come across him. Tino aspiring to become a true Vori among warriors, not giving up his dreams to become a hero. The nail smith that helps the knight upgrade the nail and wanting to reach the purity of the perfect nail. And once completed, you have the choice of killing him or to find peace in this rotten world. Or to find comfort in the friendship of Shio as they start living together. All of these characters that bring so many smiles every time I encounter them, which made my experience the more warming within this world of loss and penance. And among them all, only one truly smiles bigger than all of them. The Dung Defender, previously known as Ogrim, is the most important connection from the past of the Kingdom of the Pale King and its current downfall. For you see, when passing through the royal sewers, I was raising an eyebrow to hearing someone's laughter. <laughs> The closer I got, the louder it would get. I realized there was a reason, hence I found myself in the battlefield of a dung beetle that instead of enraged or insane, faces me with his heroic theme and battle cry. I don't know what you're thinking, who the fuck is gonna be insane in laughter living with these? The Dung Defender of once was one of the royal knights, the most respected, powerful and loyal knights of the Pale King and the White Queen. And we see small little references to their existence, as the first boss I encountered was being used by a larva, but finding out that this armor actually belonged to one of the royal knights, Hagemore, who was a very upbeat and comedic bulky knight who nobody knows if he even is alive, but he is gone from Hallow's Nest for sure, and his locks were the ones that locked the City of Tears originally. There is Amur, native to Hallow's Nest, and a very respected knight, a lady that knew about peace and patience to the point of knowing how to fight while holding a delicate flower. Finding her in a playthrough to now be this insane dying decrepit bug that her last wish is to give her a last flower that she has kept alive for the queen, the white lady who she fell in love with. Drea, who was deemed as the wisest and strongest and the most loyal to the king, a female knight like no other that would lead the Pale King's army with determination. Only to find her course beyond the ends of the kingdom, as it seems she died fighting along with her army protecting the Pale King palace from the invasion of the Mantis traders. And Isma, the nurturing kind one that even in war she would always prioritize the care for others, and Ogrim now being the last one remaining of his brethren that are now gone. 
And over and being in love with Isma made his nest right beneath Isma's lake for here rests in peace. This is not just romantic, this is, it's somber. Yet with all of his dark weight, the Dung Defender still smiles and laughs. He fights only to face a worthy opponent that he recognizes as a true knight, the Little Knight. And as he is defeated, he sleeps and dreams about his prime and the days of being with his brethren. Ogrim is truly the one character that even having little to nothing in his life, he still lives on, being a protector of hollowness in his own regard and laying close to the grave of his beloved. One knife that truly inspires me to keep on going in ways that I wouldn't even imagine, both for the good and for the bad. The places in Hallowsness relinquish all life to let the isolation take over, and while Green Path and Fung Oasis are the example of nature's overtaking actually having a sense of beauty on it, there is nothing that can compare to both the Fog Canyon and Crystal Peak. And of course, the Queen's Gardens. The Fog Canyon is actually a very peaceful area where no threats could uphold one unless hostility is given. You see these fucking jellyfish? They ain't Spongebob little catchable collectibles fucks. No, these fuckers go 9-11 on your ass if you aren't careful enough. You smack one, guess what? It will fucking chase you in one single swing with no holes bar, and you only have one answer. Also, there are some that are very dangerous that activate electricity around them. And even though it seems harmless, it will take quite some damage on the Little Knight. But even with all of his dangerous ground, the Fog Canyon has such an incomparable beauty. It's a literal desolate place with so much mesmerizing illumination and the essence and aesthetic actually made me enjoy being here for the longest time. I did remember coming across this place by accident in my over-exploration from Green Path, but alas, I was being too ballsy. But this place truly makes the harshness of the passing worth it. It is also the home of one of the dreamers, in a very fucking obnoxious boss fight that has so much movement and the only boss that is immune to the nail. But this time Quirrell assists in this fight, and when I witness this, I drop my controller. I can barely make anything out of this, and Quirrell shows his skills with the nail and goes fucking Virgil on this monstrous jellyfish and makes it finally vulnerable. Defeating Umu or whatever the fuck this kind of name is makes me capable of not just learning about the dreamer here but also use the dream nail on their comatose body and then just swing at them cause they don't even fight back. It, it's strange. It brings a certain feeling of sadness seeing such a being so helpless to the mercy of a nail. I give it While Green Path had a beautiful floor of visual, the Queen's Gardens is one place where it has overtaken in a more violent way. I'm gonna say this garden is a fucktastrophe, one that belonged to the White Lady, the Queen, but as it was forgotten and not cared for, later on it was overtaken by a group of exiled mantis that do not follow the honor code, thinking that they could have faced the infection by brute force. And all following their leader, the Traitor Lord, an ex-mantis lord gone rogue that apparently the main reason they were overtaken by the infection was the loss of their child. I have no words to say, it just shows the tragedies of war, taking into account the aftermath of the corpses of warriors and the grave where the ex-mantis lord's offspring rests. It all brings back the darkness within desolation. While this place is a threatening but peaceful one, it really cannot compare to the Crystal Peak. This place is so neon and pink, I fucking love it. 
Also in here hides the super dash and also bringing in the idea that the mini bugs are very overtaken by the infection, the lasers, the crystals of different shades of pink and purple, the many hardened creatures and the mechanical background of how a small little minority of bugs learn to become mechanical workers for their mineral discoveries. The bugs evolve into a very peculiar and dangerous hardened creature that have absorbed the environment to their own, and a strange boss that finds the magic of crystals for combat in a fucking in Mega Man style. Vegeta, look! I'm a fire in my blood. The Crystal Peak is just filled to the brim with such beauty, but it still reminds me of one thing. What happened to that mini girl bug? Well, apparently the infection is beginning to take her. She is but an example of how every bug's infection in this kingdom began. All because of the conquering of one dreamer. Those who vanquished another one, all they had to do was go back to the City of Tears. And finding out that the Vulture's Tower was hiding atop of a city this entire time. With a fucking telescope to watch the entire city from above. And also I would like to add, fuck this boss, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck all of you multiple assholes of shit! The Vulture Knights are a fucking relentless army of nail warriors that were originally guardians of the Vulture, but with their husks available, the infection is able to mutate them back to life and reanimate them to fight the Little Knight in a very annoying battle of being teamed up. It reminds me of something. Hmm. With all of this beauty and annoyance, I was able to vanquish one more dreamer that again gave no fucks, but. Then something happened after this. The infection has leaked and spread through the point of affecting the main staging area that is the closest to the Black Egg. The place where the green grass cultists were now were overtaken and absorbed by the infection. And the little mining bug is now drowsy and not mining. She is now even speaking in depressing tones of insanity. It is becoming anxious and depressing by the step. And within isolation and desolate despair, only insanity and aggression befall with pleasure. At the edge of the kingdom relies a certain piece of detail that completes a few quests on the path of the night. Firstly, while there are creatures bulkier and bigger, there is also among the falling of the snow ash a multitude of corpses on the many platforms and the bottom of the canyon. But also, there are more falling from above for some reason. And as soon as you go up, you find, finally, where the racketing and metal clanking and echoes come from. A hidden place where many exiled bugs that have survived the infection form a small little kingdom of their own. A castle forged for one purpose, to fight until the death. The Colosseum of Fools is a place where insanity and stupidity dominate, but it is where these warriors with no kingdom have found their purpose. Following a corpse of an unknown king on his throne and a menacing crowd ready to see combat, and this is a battle that once in, one cannot fall back. And it has a beginner trial, an intermediate trial, and a master trial to become a true gladiator. But one must pass the first two more than once, and the master once in order to complete not just the collection of the hunter's journal, but also two more quests than here in this area. There is also this creepy fuck that apparently was a glorious knight at some point. The infection did not get him, but he did become insane from a desolate lance and constant fighting. He is now one that hides a shining object until we defeat him, the only chasing boss we actually uphold in this game. But after this, one must prepare. Be very well equipped, because the Colosseum quests are not to be taken lightly. It took me weeks to complete all of them, but I did it with my own nail, and a breath of determination.
The Coliseum of Fools is exactly that. It has a bright and dark side to its enclosed bowl of joy. Those that are no longer part of the hollowness, that have been growing and getting stronger through the survival of these constant battles, and those that survive a loss come back stronger to try again. The corpse of a king showing that among this isolation they have become more than insane, but the infection they have fought off, it cannot affect them for how strong and relentless they are. They have found joy, pleasure, camaraderie, and brotherhood in this place. But it has also overtaken their lives to the point that they know only violence. And also... Here is a conclusion to the quest of Zote, a pathetic little warrior that cannot even harm me. At first I thought it was a bug, but it is supposed to be like this. He is the final boss of the first challenge. And it is very disappointing, yet entertaining, which takes him after being defeated back to Dirtmouth, where that little pillbug girl now simps for Zote, which opens a new dream gate for a fucking unrelenting dream boss of the Grey Prince Zote. Oh, and if one surpasses all the challenges, the last one has one final opponent. Yours for my son? Yeah, there are. You know, I'd rather not. Oh yes, I was so fucking salty and disappointed. All of this cockiness, this excitement to see a warrior that aspires to fight me using only a shield and then fucking splash like a fucking gluten-free Texas French toast toasted tortilla! Oh, but the battle against the Beastmaster is one that truly tests all reflexes and focus. It is more fair than the fucking Watcher Knights, fuck you! Alright, alright, we're calming down. It's okay, it's okay. The Watcher Knights cannot harm me anymore, right? Right? You are screwed. Yeah, you're totally screwed. Which then brings us back to the Edge of the Kingdom corpses, where you can find Tino's corpse and his last verse, where why? Why? Although disappointing, you could raise a praise to the fucker. He conquered all the levels of the Colosseum and reached the end just like you but it was fucking squashed and rid of. Still something in detail that honestly makes me love both the design and mental images of this little character. And as we conquer that, now we've witnessed horror, insanity, and violence, and finally to have all the skills necessary to fulfill an unfinished promise. Gale. <laughs> Horner gave the little knight the hints of not just the world, but everything beyond the surface. And as she waited at the edge of a kingdom, she waited for the little knight to become stronger to reach this area as she did, hiding beneath the ashes where the corpse of the legendary worm resides. And here we fight one more time, now with her not just holding back anymore, in a more enclosed area and using all of her skills and focusing us to use ours too, to the full extent. And all of this suddenly is an intense battle for royalty, for at the end, after defeating her and proving to her our capacities for the sake of the kingdom. Exploring further down to the Verm's head and find out that this marks the little knight with the same essence as the king as the corpse recognizes him. And now I am astonished with more questions. But with this falls the story of a worm that look at the deity and live in this land and decided to give the bugs sentience by first becoming like them, a bug, the Pale King. Shedding their skin of a dragon-like being and becoming a god among bugs to use his wisdom and knowledge to help them and to condemn them. This puts us to the need to explore further into the depths of the kingdom, where it is called the Ancient Basin. A place deep and secluded from most of the lands of his world and kingdom, and the home place of the Pale King, where his palace resided, now nothing more but a barren wasteland of beings that can barely have will, not even primal, not even completely infected. As if they were both alive and dead, zombified, and also the place where we face something familiar in a very disturbing way.
broken vessel appears to be of the same form as a little knight and Zolte, giving more of an idea that the little knight might not be the only one. At the green path with Hornet, I remember coming across a corpse similar to the knight, and now this, but with the infection bringing back this corpse to life. Showing that in here the infection remains in a very violent force, just as with the Watcher Knights. But the broken vessel seems to have abilities similar to the Little Knight, a dash, powerful nail swings, range attacks to hit the opponent, jump drops of powerful force and aerial bursts, but in a more brutal and animalistic way. As if this being is trying to reconcile with its instincts and abilities, but only the instinct can take a hold with the infection. Sadly, as powerful as it is, it is no match for the knight. And as we venture forth, we finally come across the corpse of Drea, who with her army defended the palace that now is completely barren. But then, using the king's mark and the dream nail, we venture forth inside a corpse to find out that the king's palace has always been beyond the dead. The Void Palace remains within this oblivion-like world, illuminated by a powerful light almost godlike, showing the godhood of the king, and apparently more bugs and guardians still exist here, but apparently they are but drones. Beings either barely existing that still worship the king as echoes of the noble bugs, or somehow advanced created beings with alchemy that can work as both protection and a hostile attack. These were the army of the king once, beings made of a force called the Void. The Void is a force, a force that appears to be almost the opposite of light, a form of pure darkness, but something more. The Little Knight appears to have a force within him of Void, just as the Shade is pure Void as an echo of his life when he dies. An evolution of abilities showing now the new upgraded dash having a void variant of power. And then when I encounter a certain room, all I could sense is a desire to shed tears. I just cannot explain it. The Queen's Nursery is a place with a small little cradle that has a very specific music, and it is the same music as this. This hints at being the place of birth of a little knight, possibly. Maybe he was here already, and also... Fuck this place and it's sauce, I swear the Pale King has a huge heart on for sauce and spikes because I could barely pass this fucking thing. Oh and guess what, in the DLC there was a challenge involving the Void Palace that plays a song called The Path of Pain. Oh yeah, I can see it, I can feel it, can you feel it Mr. Krabs? I'm really feeling it! This place kicked my ass beyond. After I passed every obstacle, every challenge, every platform, I was dead. How dead? Deader than my father. <laughs> and there I was, making a joke about the passing of my father, finding somehow a connection with this place. What in the fuck's name is wrong with me? Stop it. Get some help. After surpassing the Path of Pain and the palace's multiple challenges, finally I reach a certain area that is uncanny, like a scientist's lab. Actually, many areas seem mystical yet like a lab research area. And then after passing through a fucking weird-shaped mold, the throne. There, finally, with the king and... All this and the king has been dead this entire time, and instead of facing the infection, he retired to his fucking throne like a coward and died, and... Oh god. His power was so incredible even in his resting place, this magic was still sealed inside someone's corpse and still his creations active and strong as ever. 
and could only be attained by his own seal. Holy fuck, this guy was beyond an alchemist. And then it brings one more question, cause being a higher being, godlike, of course, he would have forces and magic of light and the soul, but where did he learn the magic of the void? Now beyond the ancient basin is something very barren of all light. It is beyond the light, beyond the kingdom's depths, and is deeper than any place the hollowedness could have. The Abyss. The Abyss is definitely the equivalent of Bug Hill. Except we don't have lime flavor bug spray. But this place screams Lovecraftian dread. It is barren of all light. The backgrounds, the music, the sound, the creatures, everything is hard to describe. But here you can find other shades. These hostile little shades. This place made me panic in a mental way. It had so many questions and I had no answers. But I had to go deeper, further, beyond the abyss. The lower I got, the darker it would get. Not harder, but creepier. And using light and movement at my advantage, I learned more about the way of the void here. For this is the birthplace of the void, the place where everything that is the energy, the force and magic of the void came from. And as I came closer, I saw more remains of bugs, little corpses similar to the little knight. It got darker, deeper, I felt more desperate, more alone, until I finally reached a point of an egg. An egg with my reflection there, and as I reach, I... Okay, 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 so before I actually continue, I have to explain one harsh truth. Now, with all of this happening, there is one thing. This is the path to a good ending. For completing the White Palace brings a certain item that is broken, and it's in half, and can only be completed once one completes a quest with the White Queen, who is still alive. Broken, injured, and very mindless, probably traumatized beyond belief after seeing all of this downfalling. And the quest of a delicate flower is the most annoying fucking quest ever. All of this to deliver a fucking flower from this raggedy ann looking fuck that wants to give its sentiments to the queen. But to deliver it, you cannot touch anything that hits you. One hit and you lose the flower and have to go back and get it. I had to memorize and master every single path, every jump, every swing, every dash, calculate every hop with a nail. This was my fucking death mountain. Oh yeah, by the way, those that say real men are made by playing Dark Souls fucking play Death Mountain. Oh no, I'm not talking about Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess or any of these. No, 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 no. Played on Link's Adventure. This game will kick your fucking ass and Death Mountain is nothing more than the second level. You wanna be a fucking man? Well, get this game. This is the game where men become beasts. I'm so sorry, I just had to throw that out there, cause Hollow Knight really reminded me a lot of Link's adventure and its 2D perspective platforming and combat with the place and the harshness. Now getting this fucking thing completed already says the little knight for one ending. We can just go forth and go back to a very fucking creepy area, but If you decide to be patient, complete these stacks and go through this mentally and emotionally challenged path, you're rewarded with the truth. A flashback happens that brings the memory of the little knight being born and awoken as he tries his best to climb up to the top, with the king expressing a certain prose of creating the perfect knight against the radiance's plague, with a warrior with no emotions, no mind, and after climbing suddenly... The scene is completed along with the palace's path of pain, where you see the pale king alive interacting with the hollow knight when he was a tiny little vessel, ready to be guided and trained, and how in one scene he looks at his king in a sort of mentor father figure. And here we see the hollow knight look at the little knight back, sort of like saying I'm sorry, but with no dialogue, no explanation, just no spoon feeding, letting the player bask in and take it all in. And it is somber, depressing yet beautiful to witness, a conclusion to a lot of questions. The Hollow Knight was what it became because it was chosen as the first to come on top out of all the other failures. 
and the little knight was nothing more than one vessel that survived and became stronger over time, just like the Hollow Knight and its soldier Silvling. Also, all of these vessels have no gender, so I have been assuming it's gender this entire time calling it a him. Excuse me, it's ma'am! It is ma'am! After completing this scene and trial, acquiring upgrades that are now making the soul spells of the knight become void spells along with God's soul. Making him finally reach completion with his abilities, then the completion of the Void Heart, and being able to be comforted with this story. And as this comes to an end, we realize there is one more step to take, to go where no bug would want to go, a place I have been fucking avoiding to talk about. You see, after the Mantis Lords, you have access to this place. Sure, areas could be blocked, but little by little, one acquiring the upgrades of a knight give more accessibility and even fight off another part of where Silta is trapped. Well, let's delve into an area that is beyond the edge of the kingdom, where there is no soul safe to walk. Where it is not just forgotten by any god, but forsaken even by the lands of a kingdom. Or rather, being this place, its own original kingdom. For the Abyss is the embodiment of the darkest pit, literally hell. It is snuggle bunnies compared to the deep nest. Now, let me give you a bit of... Let me... You got something to say, Ebony? Anyways, to ensure one thing, what does the knight's design, Kirby, the entirety of these characters, the relationships, Animal Crossing, and my cat have in common? They cute and warm as fuck! So after encountering a lot of dark themes, it shows the desperation and desolation of loss of essence here. But the reason the deepness is even harder to take in for me is because of my arachnophobia. I don't remember my life before I was 5 years old, and even then it is very blurry, and there are reasons for it. As I have learned in recent years, but there is one thing I remember clearly and vividly with very graphic intent, the texture, the flavor in my mouth, the crawling on my chest, the sensations in my head and chest, the smell of the moment, and to know what it was when there was sunlight coming from the outside of a window, and later to be consumed by the afternoon till dusk. I was for sure frozen because a four year old could not fathom to move at the sight of having a black widow on his chest. I remember clearly not being afraid of any form of insect or bug or hell, even snakes sort the whole free population that I remember because of a problem in my hometown and apparently in other areas of a state in the country. But the one thing that I remember to this day, it still gives me that same sensation, smell, flavor, and tone of sound inside my head as the sight of an eight-legged creature with numerous eyes and claws, like tendrils that show a menacing colored body that not even the Plutonian Knight could compare to its darkest presence. I have come across many spiders and video games that there is always a huge struggle to overcome. My biggest was in a game that involved the entire gameplay filled with spiders, but in this game the deepness is the worst I have encountered. It was very well designed to express fear and arachnophobia with its claustrophobic platforming and tunneling. The visuals of constant dim illumination and a sense of dark blue, which I found out is a color that affects the emotional state of the brain at night. Then the fact that the background constantly has shifting movement of something beyond bug, and the sounds of constant fucking crawling and crackling, playing with my senses. The deepness also is home to grotesque beings that look like they came out from fucking nature Geiger's asshole. And if one is not careful, it will play with your senses of safety, keeping you on edge. Because my first time playing here, I was passing, feeling overpowered, then I killed a couple creatures that would come out of the walls and floor and ceiling. And then I heard crackling and hence had this corpse come back to life and start coming chasing me, even passing over the walls. That made me ten times even more anxious of this place. Oh, and one time there was a fucking grub and I saved it and it fucking turned into this abomination of a thing! I'm sorry, but fuck you! This place also is home to a very peculiar faction. A faction divided apparently by a civil division, but both of the same species. The spider factions of both the beast crawlers and however you call them, which are creatures that are self-explanatory and completely instinctively brutal, strong, enough to tank nail slashes and know how to fend off attacks or block. 
Even NPCs could possibly attack back. And then there is the Dreamweavers. The Dreamweavers live in a more secluded area of the Deep Nest where apparently they were more civilized spiders. Creators of sealing magic and other forms of combat with string, also to find out that this is where Hornet was originally born. She is the only child of the king and the leader of the spiders, Hera, the beast, one that would inspire combat both physical and mental, sort of a true warrior and the last dreamer to vanquish. After conquering all the dreamers, the black egg crackles more. Hornet recognizes the little knight and all their doings up till now, and come into terms with the eradication of the soul of her mother. And also trying to explore further, I come across a fucking copy of the little knight. This gave me so many vibes of the SAX from Metrifusion. And as I tried to follow it, then I was lost, eventually coming with some strange looking bugs near a bench, and then... This brings one to a deeper area. These are worshippers of a god, something they see as a god, a creature that apparently has conquered many other creatures that were strong enough to overpower this deepness. But all were prey to this one. And as I escape and explore, I came across my copy. If this is a creature, well, it looks very minuscule. So what do you do? Oh. 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 Oh gosh, you know, I'm not much on speeches, but it's so gratifying to leave you wallowing in the mess you've made. You're screwed. Thank you. Bye. This? I have to fight this? You fucks worship an oversized infected spider that takes the form of whatever it preys upon and also looks like it has a body made out of void? Truth be told, I have problems with this fucker. But nonetheless, I overcame. The deep deepness truly evoke my biggest fears, but I was able to come to terms with that fear. Because as I learned through my many years of gaming, fear can make me turn back and shiver. But it is that same fear that has made me become stronger to overcome. The bigger that sizzling fear becomes, the stronger I can grow. The overcoming of the deepness is but another small part, because after defeating the last dreamer, now the dream nail activates a more powerful form, able to use gates as teleportation forms. Also able to complete from here the stack stations and find out that the one that always transports us has a nest where all of the elder stacks have perished, but there's still hope of this small civilization to come back, even in the dockets of Oz. And after empowering the Dream Nail, one can finally face the Dream Bosses, while the Dream Warriors were already tragic boss battles of wills that still were strong after their passing. These other dream bosses are on a whole nother level. They are forms of these bosses, few bosses in which they become even more powerful and rampant than before, but also hint at a world where those who pass, their wills help them become greater, something far more than just a bug. The battles of these few bosses are now up a huge notch, and one has to be very well equipped and prepared, and even one of them shows our little dung defender how he used to be at the prime in this dream world. And also, if it makes these stronger, there is another one even more powerful. While we save this wee pill bug and also she develops that crush, she then gets infatuated with Sote after he is defeated on the Colosseum, and this makes her create a very righteous form of Sote, to the point of making a statue as if worship him. Creating a gate of the dreams and souls where her worshipping has created a new dream boss and the second strongest dream boss, the false god, the vigorous, diligent, overwhelming, gorgeous, passionate, terrifying, beautiful, powerful, great Prince Sultan. 
This boss fight becomes stronger every time one defeats it, and it's supposed to be defeated five times. The failed champion is a form of hegemon that the Lars saw as how he was supposed to be. The Lost Kin is the essence of what this broken vessel had as aspirations of becoming a fighting being, a knight but still with the infection. The Soul Tyrant is the truest form at its prime of a soul rendering bug that was defeated before, and as being a combatant of a soul in the dream world he is well aware of his capacities. And of course Ogrim is the White Defender, but there is one more that should not be taken lightly. After all I said Zote is the second most powerful. Upon further exploration beyond the kingdom, one will encounter a weird looking bug with a red cloak and this one hints a follow of a fred flame. So after exploring further from where the little knight originally came from, where there is even more area in the desert where bugs are known to be lost or lose their memories. And then within the confines to find a torch that plays a very creepy music. And then to go back to Dirtmouth just to find a new open place. This is the Grim Troop. Looking like a circus and with followers with a lot of passion just like the Colosseum. But their leader actually is alive and very fucking menacing. Grim is supposedly a blood moth, a being that leads his entire troop into kingdoms that have failed to bring entertainment and be fed with the penance, suffering and the nightmares of the remainings of their beings. He is very aware of a dream world and he feeds from it, just like there is dreams, there is also nightmares. The quest seems entertaining as there are a few things one can do. There is this weird character that gives temporary buffs that break, but he can reforge them. But apparently he's a cannibal, so yeah. Then there is another like him at the Green Troop, and she can actually eat those items and make them eternal and unbreakable. Also, she apparently eats that cannibal guy, and I just have no fucking way of reacting to that, so there's two raccoons having sex. Then Grimm offers his child to feed him, a tiny adorable little baby that apparently to grow one must follow a traditional ritual of vanquishing embodiments of loss, pain and nightmares, of these nightmare flames and then absorb them through the child. Then as it grows, one must activate a bigger part of the ritual by entertaining the crowd and having a very folkloric and flamboyant fight with Grimm. He is a very fucking hard boss that uses a lot of very peculiar magic, which might be his own nightmare and dark magic, also hinting as his abilities of void. And also the fact that this design, way of being, and even the boss fight are a fucking homage to Dracula from Castlevania. Oh god, but he's way stronger and faster than Dracula. But with all of these dream bosses, in order to fight Grimm with full force, we must conquer all the dream bosses. Even his. You see, after completing his quest of the Nightmare Flames, the Grimm child grows and is even sentient, but this is apparently a reincarnation of Grimm. Every cycle of the kingdom befalling, he must reincarnate, use the loss, the dread, and darkness to become anew. And this is both poetic and desolating, like a symbolism that everything will always have an end, but for every end there is a new beginning, no matter how dark, how nasty it is, there is always something new to look forward to. And also, the Grim Child can attack enemies with little damage, but for that mega buff, one must go deeper, and we fight these flames and even listen to the words of a musician of the Grim Troop that says, the cycle could end with a very specific sealing tribunal, but then, one cannot face the dreams of Grimm. You can seal it, be done with it and move on, end the nightmare cycle, but why would you? When you could prove to overcome the embodiment of nightmares, fears, darkness, pretty much Satan himself incarnate, but as so, one must defeat all the dream bosses and the main super boss of a nightmare world to become more than just a dreamer.
The one thing I can say is that all of these fuckers made me get so much carpal tunnel, and Jesus, it made my reflexes be demanding for this. Fuck souls like, be ready to dash away and slash with a lot of fucking patience. Also, I must point out, Nightmare King Grimm is a super boss because his title and boss name have a full screen presentation. It is badass. His theme is already enjoyable as a boss battle, but once one fights his final form, oh boy, the song turns full gothic metal. The only music in the game that actually uses metal. And Jesus, the way it works with his attacks and design. It screams desperation, menace, penance, violence, ooh, I fucking love it. Also, he always bows and he gives you a free head, but if you do, he will fucking make you pay, so I learned here. Do not interrupt a fucking bow. I also learned that in Elder Ring. Fighting this fucker that bows before the fight? Also, fuck, how many fucking Zoltes can this bitch dream? She fucking imagined so many twisted fucked up creatures with Zoltes' face. Are you sure you're okay? Do you need a fucking padded room with grippy socks? Answer me, damn it! I am so sorry, but these bosses truly took it out on me. But hey, at least now I can go around and be happy. I've completed so much of this game. And as I passed through the areas, I learned I completed even the Hunter's Journal. I was now recognized as a true hunter. Fuck, I thought I was worthy of a boss fight, but I guess not. I found even the Fluke Mom that is an optional boss and has a fucking disgusting magic. Also to learn to create very powerful combos with the magic equipment the little knight learns. Then backtracking to get every single nook and cranny and upgrade and then to see the little minor bug that fully became infected and now is an enemy. Now after seeing her whole, her dreams, everything fade away. It's a black fly in my chardonnay. It's a death row pardon. Two minutes too late. And isn't it ironic? Don't you think? It's like rain. I'm going to hell. Oh wait, we already went to hell and went fine. I am so fucking done, so what's next? After overcoming so many monsters, so many creatures, horrors, dreadful paths that would make angels cry and demons have nightmares, finally, the black egg. Also, by the way, after grabbing all the gruffs to their father and getting very good fucking charms and rewards, he fucking eats them and I couldn't kill the fucking asshole. Team Cherry, let me kill the fat fuck. Also, this bitch that allowed me to use the bank then runs away with my fucking money. It's not your money, it's our money. It's for free. <gasps> free. I then I had to chase her, find her in this milky cave that looks like a cum dungeon. Yes, you heard that correctly and clearly. The cum dungeon. And slash her to fucking death and get all my money back and more. Truly shows the failure of banks. Right, Silicon Valley Bank? Yeah, I got fucking political, so what are you gonna do about it? Oh. So going back, we get all the upgrades and go inside the black egg, and honestly, it is the most somber and enigmatic ambience I've ever seen. It's so severely creepy with its echoes and desolation. The sudden dark isolation making one remember the void and the abyss, and the dreadfulness of the ancient basin. All of it truly swallowing one's soul at the whole, and then finally coming into an entrance where one can see chains, and within those chains, the Hollow Knight. His stare glaring at the little knight wherever he moves, but now one final quest to break the chains and every chain broken adds a new violin to the music in the background as it becomes louder with every broken chain suddenly silence. This is it, the battle against the Hollow Knight. The legendary hero of Hallow's Nest that was made as a perfect vessel of God and Void, trained to become the perfect knight with no soul, no will, no emotion, no... no future. But failed to contain the plague, because he loved the king. 
One can dream slash enemies and sometimes get glances of their will still lingering. But the Hollow Knight in comparison seems very sentient, but very angry, somber, depressing, yet regretful. And in the code of a the game, there is one line that kills me. This shows me how the Hollow Knight truly saw the king as his father, making him actually vulnerable to a will, to feeling emotions, and maybe have an actual soul, which made it possible for the infection to spread as he was made not just to fight, but to conceal the plague within himself. Pretty much the pale king used the Hollow Knight as his fucking life insurance for his creation. Now that he overthrew another deity, eradicated many other factions, overtook others to his assimilation, isolated those who did not follow his kingdom's forming and clap a couple cheeks. I mean, what is the deal with the Pale King? Imagine wanting to fuck this! But the truest tragedy of the Hollow Knight is that he is but the consequence of the sins of the Pale King, and he had no choice. He only did what he was made for, and with the music, it shows. And as the battle reaches the point where the Hollow Knight is half-life, the music changes into a more depressing manner, slower and more anxious, a violin that truly pulls on the harsh strings, as we see the Hollow Knight grasp its last sentient will trying to still fight back the infection within himself with the only arm he has left as he impales himself. The infection trying to still survive within him as it starts grappling him and using him for combat but still, and once the battle becomes more erratic with his movements, one has to overcome, show the Hollow Knight how much we have grown as he finally subdues. This is where one has the choice. We can actually let the Hollow Knight overtake Hornet, and we keep fighting, but here is where the multiple endings happen. There is one where the little knight truly breaks and defeats the Hollow Knight, and now absorbs the infection, getting chained and sealed, becoming the new Hollow Knight, and repeating the cycle to await for another vessel to eventually awaken and repeat the same trial he overcame. Another ending involving the same situation with Hornet, but one slashing at the Hollow Knight constantly as he now becomes Berserk and one has to defeat him with his final erratic beast instinct, just as an animal that is cornered on its last breath. And so the same thing repeats, but now damning Hornet, but creating a seal that converts Hornet as the Dreamer. And as Hornet is inside being sealed, it means nobody can break the seal unless Hornet's body is terminated, which it would be until the body of the Little Knight is completely overtaken, making this mentally tragic too. And then there is the ending that is canon and true to us. One where once Hornet comes and makes the Hollow Knight kneel, we slash him with a dream nail one last time, entering inside his soul and mind, as there is a whole new world inside him. And as we enter, we have another prompt. The same prompt as with the Mantis Lords, where a top of the platform allows us to challenge something, or someone. As in the far beyond, the sun shines brighter, wings expand, showing it not to be a sun, but finally a giant shining moth, showing its title, The Radiance. This is the god that was overthrown by the Pale King. This is what must be overcome, and in reality it is not as easy as a fight. It is one that takes so much effort and sweat and tears. But the saddest thing is that even with this, if one loses once, we have to defeat the Hollow Knight again before fighting the Radiance, being the Hollow Knight the only obstacle, but one that won't give up easily. And the tragedy that all of these, the infection, the death of many, the wrath of envious and narcissistic gods, and the befalling of a knight, a child left to grow alone, and many forgotten in the behind. This is all by the neglect of a king, the mishaps of a leader, the ambitions of another higher being wanted to play more than God, and the failures of a father.
This game shows how the greatest sins of a parent can become infectious, because the most important thing of a parent is to protect, to tutor, to mend, to, to, to be there when one only needs love. And I think that's why I connect with Hollow Knight so much, because in the end of the day, maybe I could relate some of my own damage to this game, but I can choose to let the damage overtake me and damage others. Or, I could repeat the cycle, or better yet, how about we do something about it? Defeating the Radiance is a motherfucking challenge, but it is doable, and once it comes close, little shades come to fruition as they start to escape from the void little by little and inspire the night. And once the Radiance is finally defeated, both the Hollow Knight and the Little Knight unleash their void powers with full rage and obliterate the bitch how she deserves it. This brings the true ending, where the Hollow Knight is finally defeated and laid to rest, as so is the Little Knight with Ornit representing the somber respect. There's no dialogue happening here as from the abyss, we see the little shades finally laid to rest, as there is no longer a need for the void to be awoken. Hallowsness, after it is the decaying corpse of a kingdom, had been overtaken by something more. It finally lays to rest with a beautiful theme, a live mythiv that encapsulates so many of the themes of the bosses. The theme of a Hollow Knight, truly a beautiful sight to behold. Oh wait, we're not completely done yet, because after that we can keep playing, and I did more just to fight every single fucking hidden boss and quest. I even forgot to mention that the mold in the Pale King's palace hinted at another experiment created by the Pale King that was now called the Collectionist, a void creature that all it did was collect bugs out of pure pleasure. It gave the idea that the Pale King probably had experimented with more than just vessels that eventually created the Little Knight and the Holy Knight, and again, the broken vessel was one that escaped but was eventually killed. Then Zolte, who the fuck knows what he is, but as it was mentioned before, the vessels were created by the power of soul, with a mix of void and god. To truly complete Hollow Knight, one has to go back to the Royal Waterways, where the most disgusting beings of Hollowsness are still crawling, but now one can find at the bottom of the area, at what you would call a garbage hole, one finds a coffin. A very peculiar coffin, opening it brings a very thick bug called the God Seeker. The God Seeker is one that has been traveling through many kingdoms, searching for gods to worship, and apparently he was attracted by the essence of a god in this kingdom, but he became lost and he wasn't able to find such a god. As we find out, he must have felt either the Radiance's essence or the leftover essence of a pale king that originally was a deity-like being, or even the Hollow Knight as he was made of both Void and God. But then again, so is the Little Knight, yet the God Seekers does not acknowledge the Little Knight at all, but if we take the Dream Nail on him, we are now transferred to a whole new world. The Pantheon of the Gods of Hollow's Nest. Yes, the Kingdom of Hollow's Nest has its own pantheon to forge. Just like multiple historical cultures, this kingdom now forged its own religious forces, based on the bosses that the Little Knight has fought. And so, the God Seeker and his people are here to worship whichever one takes the mantle of the God to worship and their demigods. From here in the God Home, it is noticeable that it has the same visual and background essence of where the Dreamers and the Radiance came from. Having a hint that maybe even the Dreamers were deity-like, and the particles on the air are somewhat similar to the Void Palace. Again, hinting at the godly powers of the Pale King. This is where we can face different bosses we already faced, but now much stronger, smarter, and with areas more claustrophobic and demanding. It is a challenge to taste the best. And there are bosses that are never encountered before that only exist here. But in here, there are not just bosses acknowledged as possible demigods. Each challenge has a god as a final boss. And they are powerful enough to be recognized as actual gods among the other bosses. 
These are the Nail Warriors, the Nail Masters, the Nail Sage, and one named the Pale Prince. And so one must overcome in order for the Little Knight to unleash the recognition of Godhood, to become a god, and unlock a new ending to the story. Also, you need to turn your nail into a noodle and other fucking debuffs in order to actually complete 100% the Pantheon. The first part of the Pantheon of the Master has one saying, Gods by soul and nail, bound brothers, sworn to guard the weak, masters of a sacred ground, help us find the god we see. The second Pantheon of the Artist presents, O God inspired by the arts, whose works shall eternal endure, peer beyond our minds and hearts, reveal to us the god most pure. And the third Pantheon of the Sage quotes, Sagely god of the cunning and bold, sharpen our nails and show us the odds. O greatest of masters, we wish to behold, the one still greater, the god of gods. With these three it hints as there are levels of godhood itself, and the necessity to overcome. Of course, there is one more pantheon to overcome, but that can only be open once the others are conquered. Unlocking all the bosses and releasing their god forms, and allowing the little knight to overcome its Herculean quest. Though well, each one has taught me before, Oro and Mato, the twins that hated each other, now to see that they are willing to overgo their differences in order to show the true power of a nail. The great master Shio, who is willing to show his mastery of a nail after retirement, demonstrating that he has not become any form of rusty. And finally, Sly. Sly was the original nail coach, the master of the arts of a nail, and the one that trained these, and even as tiny as he is, he should not be underestimated. He seems like an equal in that regard, that the little tiny knight, even as tiny as he is, his power has conquered even an envious god, and now to vanquish a possibility of many. Well, let's raise a nail in hand, and accept the challenge to conquer the gods of Hollow's Nest.
Battles of East Pantheons really reconnect with one thing, the little knight never became stronger. It was me as a player that learned to use every single equipment to the advantage of making the knight a true warrior. Now with soul, masks, and nail upgrades, it still makes the knight a squishy and easy to kill little boy, but the necessity to be precise. To not show fear, but true patience and respect for both the enemy and to the self. Something I've learned in my life both as in the mat of combat, in everyday life, and as a gamer. But overcoming these nail warriors that have been recognized as pantheon beholders, one unlocks the pantheon of the night. This is where I sweat so much and the salt I brought could fucking overflow five planet earths for sure. This is one that is filled with some of the most annoying and demanding bosses in the entire game. Even a- Oh fuck you, a fight, Nosk, what? <laughs> but the one thing I love is that at the end of this pantheon reside the famed Pale Prince, one warrior just standing in his armor cape. And as he turns, he shows with full force who he is. The pure vessel, the Hollow Knight in his prime, when he was the strongest, without the infections. With his nail at his sharpest and with two arms, now using both void and soul magic to the fullest. With many abilities similar to the Little Knight, but with his legendary capacities. This is the biggest moment for me. It is when two siblings finally fight one on one at their best. No interruptions, no infection, or anything holding them back as the Voidlings and Shades watch from within. Who is the true Hollow Knight? The Path of Pain is a very fitting song for this battle, and as the battle comes, it is one that made me shiver in intensity. Oh yeah, every time you die, you have to play the entire Pantheon section from the beginning. Oh fucking boy! You done fucked it up! But even with the harsh environment, the claustrophobic platforms, the battlefield that crunches down to a single screen, the music, the illumination, the designs, with the God Seekers staring in awe, and with each evolution, making the God Seeker start to acknowledge the Little Knight. And finally, as one defeats the Pale Prince, we witness once more the Hollow Knight at his little form, surrounded by all the vessels that were once ditched by the Pale King. And now, they all know fully well what is next, as one last screech hints at the next challenge. To defeat the Radiance once more where she was at the strongest, when she was at her prime, becoming the absolute Radiance, when she was still the god of this place worshipped by the Dream Moths, reigning over everything with no adversity. It is even an even much harder battle, and one that shows why the Radiance was a god. But here we have the weight of a fallen kingdom, people that finally found life, peace, love, ambition, happiness, and in our nail the shine and spark of those who believe in this little knight. 
even the Hollow Knight himself. As the Radiance is now encountered by the chase that rise from the void and make it possible for the Knight to be inspired to combat more and more, and finally at the top of a last strike, and then releasing something beyond the power of an absolute god. This is where one unlocks the absolute ending, where the little knight along with the entire void and the hollow knight, they all have given the void of the little knight the ultimate force to become the void lord. A being beyond the powers of the light of the radiance, as it tries to screech for survival, but it's all for naught. All the suffering, all the destruction and desolation, all ripped and torn apart by the consequences of the failed father to raise one last time and vanquish this filthy being worshipped by the weak. And in this moment, the God Seeker is consumed by pure void as he finally succumbs to the bleeding of the overflowing black blood and becomes consumed forever sealing the god home as it is now overcome to break the cycle of seeking gods constantly to make the little knight finally assume the path of godhood. And back at the black egg, Horn is still waiting, realizing the infection is fading finally, and then the hollow knight coming out. No dialogue, nothing more than a random scene. Maybe, just maybe, it could be seen as another battle, or maybe as a positive as the hollow knight could possibly finally live the life he deserved to enjoy. Now this is beautiful as it is, but there is another ending with the delicate flower. Oh yeah, one thing I didn't mention. The delicate flower can be given to some characters in the game and create special dialogues. But to be the absolute radiance and holding the delicate flower then unlocks the same ending but with the void being purified by the delicate flower which purifies this black blood. Allowing both the God Seeker and the Little Knight to rest in peace at this fairly illuminated graveyard. But to fucking get this ending, one must pass the fucking pantheons and the absolute radiance with this fucking flower intact. Do not be hit a single time, holy fuck! So is it doable? I don't think it matters. Just that it's fucking harder than hard. Here resides the completion of a Hollow Knight, and the completion of not just a story, but the cycle of the fallacies of a pale king, the desolate consummation of a broken kingdom, the final act and possible continuation of the Nightmare Troop, the reconciliation of factions divided by a plague beyond their understanding, and the possibility of recovery. This is but a symbolism of a recovery and hope from healing. Healing from damage, from oppression, from depression, from repression, from the most horrible scars the time can deal to one. And even with the whole night being a simple game that looks cute, it has some of the most amazing moments in gaming I could have ever experienced. With wonderful characters that breathe life into this forsaken world that show that even amongst the darkest of moments, there's still hope, there's still beauty, but to achieve it, one must keep going. Even when falling, one has one more chance. Failed again? We can stand up again, until we learn why we fail. Now, the whole night still has different challenges to do in the game, such as with the overcharm method where one uses multiple equipments beyond the limits of a little knight and makes him completely a bitch by taking more damage than anything constantly. There's a lot of speedrunning methods and challenges with the exploits of frames and momentum with the different abilities, creating different challenges for speedrunners of a game. And for sure, the replayability factor. And hell, if one wants to create the Nuzlocke challenge on Hollow Knight, there is a Steel Soul mode, where if one dies, there is no coming back, it is one life and that's it. And one has to make it work, one single life to survive the entire game until the end. This kind of adversity overcoming is what inspires me. It's a wonderful and beautiful game that has gotten an immense following. Now, with a sequel in the making, a lot of fan-made projects to increase the world of Hollow Knight. Hell, someone even made a mod called The Pale Court, where one faces all the knights from the Pale King that we didn't get to fight. 
even giving Ogrim a new fight with his beloved Isma, and of course, Tino getting his boss fight finally to show upon the eyes of the fans his capacities. But the most beautiful thing I gained from this game is learning many lessons, not just for gaming, but for life. While the sins of a parent are of what made this entire story become what it is, the horrible gothic desolation Hollow Knight beholds is one that could be the nightmares of a civilization. Bringing the epiphany of an epitaph to all we know as a regular life to be taken down by the unknown and the misunderstood. That is what fear truly beholds, but as gothic stories go, there is truly no happy ending here. There is a sour happiness in Hollow Knight, for no matter the outcome, the little knight's fate shall always be chained to the Doom. But it is a choice of one to choose how much the results of their efforts shall bring fruit at last. Now, we've witnessed a small poem in the beginning, but that poem was incomplete, and so, let me read you the complete Elegy of Hallow's Nest. And whiles beyond they speak your name with reverence and regret, for none could tame our savage souls, yet you the challenge met. On their palest watch, you taught we change, paste instincts were redeemed, a world you gave to bug and beast as they never dreamed. How cherished dreams you granted and delivered more, but in dismay you found too late our desires had no end. What cost to tame us savagery, you gave your all and then gave more. Yet desire still laid unquenched, more dreams remain your energy. Amongst that spread a dreadful scourge, that force returned our aggressive urge, and turned us back to beasts or husks, our souls consumed to the light above. Within your corpse can still be heard the plaintive cries of one, who took our loss and pain and dreams inside itself too. Through its pain we found the truth that must now be confessed, for nothing could contain such things but perfect emptiness. This elegy taught me to learn from the mistakes of the past, not just mine, but of others. Because in the end, we all have damage, we all fail, and we all suffer, but to embrace the damage is part of being a knight, and the choices we make forge the knight's end. Now, will you follow in the same footsteps of the Hollow Knight and repeat the same cycle? Or will you bring someone to the same zeal, till the end of your own path? Maybe you will find a way to break the same cycle and find a new path. Or maybe, just maybe, you will learn to overcome not just the cycle, but your own limits. Damage is unavoidable after all, but it is what you do with that damage that counts. And that makes you a knight that can overcome even the gods.